Hello and welcome to another episode of Laptop Retrospective and today I have a long-awaited model that I have wanted to feature on this channel. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the infamous ThinkPad 600. And this is really the genesis of what would become the modern day T-Series. And there is so much to talk about for what is an unassuming little computer. This was released back in April of 1998, and it was made through until June of 1999. And it moved away from the bento box style that we saw with the 700 series, where the keyboard lifted up and all the parts came out. This would also be essentially what would come just before the introduction of the T-series, with the T20 uh, essentially being the thing that replaced this. Now, there are quite a few firsts to talk about here, and I have actually mentioned these uh, in earlier videos. Long-term viewers of the channel might recall that the ThinkPad 600 is actually the very first one to feature a chamfered edge right here. And if you want to know more about the history of that, then I would strongly encourage that you check out this video here, where I talk to David Hill, who was the person behind that design change, and the inspiration and how it pretty much has stuck with ThinkPad ever since. The other thing that we see on this model is the third button. So the third button was designed to essentially uh, make scrolling and windowing a better experience and you better believe that I have a video on that straight from the source and you can click up here to learn more about it. It's also interesting because this button has essentially remained on all ThinkPads moving forward. So this is really a neat time capsule of where some of these ideas began and some of the ideas that are still with us even to this very day on a modern ThinkPad. I should also point out that there is a bit of a story behind this very specific model. And here's what I mean by that. Many of you might be aware that ThinkPads are, depending on what they are, a bit of a collector's item. And the 600 is turning into no exception. So much so that finding a ThinkPad 600 that was within a price range for my channel was a bit of a challenge. And I was hunting through the internet and I actually found one, an example on shopgoodwill.com. And this is a copy of the listing. And I was able to bid on this and get it for a grand total of 60 US dollars. Now the problem is, is that I'm Canadian and Goodwill does not ship up here. So I actually had a friend, a uh, longtime friend, uh, Tommy, buy this on my behalf and then ship it up to me. Uh, he did a little bit of diagnostic work on it beforehand, but I was pretty confident that we could get this thing up and running. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. This is actually the original sticky note that was on the listing. You can see it in the picture there. And yeah, there was lots of errors definitely, but if you know your stuff, then it's just a bunch of CMOS related issues and easily cleared. At any rate, I do want to thank Tommy for helping me get this into Canada because it's actually a pretty decent example for what we're going to be looking at today. All right, so let's talk some specifications. In terms of the screen, we had two major options available, a 13.3 inch, which was a 1024 by 768 panel, or a 12.1 inch, which was an 800 by 600 panel. They're not interchangeable, just so you know. So if you have one that has one of those panels, you're not swapping it over to the other, uh, you may as well just find a different unit. CPU configurations were a Pentium MX266, or a mobile Pentium 2 233, 266, 300, and a 400 upgrade option was possible. It wasn't officially listed on the FRU, but the socket is the same and it does go in there. Your GPU was a Neomagic Magicgraph 128XD, which was a whopping two megabyte card. So you're not going to the races with that, but it's still pretty cool. RAM was 32 megabytes soldered to the board and it was a maximum of 416 megabytes. So how that worked is you had 32 on the board, and then you had two expansion slots, one that could hold 256 and one that could hold 128. And this was only possible on the Pentium 2 variants. The Pentium 1 was a maximum of 256. Hard drives in these things were uh, two gigabyte standard, but you could get a theoretical maximum of 128. Uh, it was really popular to put compact flash drives into these, 
Um, if you have enough room, not always, you might also be able to find one of these guys and shove it in there. It's a little bit tight for something like that on this model. And a couple other things to note is that this did feature the Ultra Slim Bay, which is not to be confused with the Ultra Bay Slim that would be on later models. And this bay up here would actually be able to sport a whole variety of different things from CD to floppy to DVD to zip to LS120. And if you don't know what that last one is, I don't blame you. So speaking of which, let's do a quick tour of the ports of this machine because there is a little bit to talk about there. So starting on the left hand side, we do have obviously our uh, vent. We've got a power switch. We have a 56K modem. And just by the vent, we actually have our USB port underneath this little door. We have the Kensington lock slot on the side and then one of the latches to open up the machine. On the front, we do have the ultra slim bay. And if we reach underneath, we can go ahead and remove that bay. And a series of other bays can be installed in this. And this would be a good time to mention that this accessory here, which is essentially an ultra slim bay caddy, is compatible with these. So we can take uh, this floppy drive out and drop it in. And as you can see, it plays perfectly well with it. Speaking of that, if we move over to this side of the machine, we do have another trap door that actually reveals the plug-in for this connector. So this is where you would plug in, um, and it is really hard to line up. There we go. This is where you would plug in your floppy drive or whatever else you had uh, stuffed in this bay. Uh, very, very convenient if you didn't want to be hot swapping and you wanted to run both at the same time, then that option was available to you. Carrying on down, we do have a separate headphone and microphone jack, the IR blaster, and then the card bus PC CMIA slot. Uh, and there's two of those stacked on top of one. Another. We also have, of course, the latch for the other side. And on the back, we have no uh, fewer ports. Over here, we've got power. Under this, we've got serial. Here is our docking connector, and this would take select to dock two or select to dock three. And then we have a, another panel here for printer and then VGA. And then lastly, we have an output for a mouse because obviously there's no trackpad on this. And I don't think they bothered to put a output for another keyboard because let's be real, it's a ThinkPad keyboard. It's probably better than the one that you wanted to plug into it anyway. So that's it for ports, ladies and gentlemen. So let's go ahead and flip this thing over and begin looking at how we would disassemble this and remove all of its components. To do this, all we will need is a screwdriver. So let's begin. The first thing that we'll do is remove the battery, which is a simple matter of just pulling the switch and levering the battery out of place. And this was a one size only battery. The next thing to do, of course, is to eject the ultra slim bay which again, easily done. The next thing that we can do is remove this cover here. And this exposes several key components. The first you will notice is this non-factory battery. So the CMOS battery, unsurprisingly, in this old machine died and I had to get it remade. Now, one thing that I will note, and I saw this on several places on the internet, is you are dealing with a CR2025. I don't know if you can use like a CR2032 and it works okay, but I went for the exact factory specifications and the wiring is different. So if you are a connoisseur of working with CMOS batteries, the wiring in the connector is ever so slightly different. So my recommendation is to gut the old one, uh, keep the same wire and connectors and then re-solder your brand new battery to it. And then you don't have any errors. We do have two RAM slots located right here and they are stiff. So with those two RAM uh, chips removed, we can continue the basic uh, servicing components of this machine. So the next thing to do is to remove the hard drive and that will require either a coin or a flathead screwdriver. 
I'm going to opt out for the flathead screwdriver here. And that screw is not captive, at least not anymore. And then we need to very carefully coax uh, this cover out. And I think this cover originally would have been connected. I'm not 100% sure. And then it's a simple matter of flipping out that blue tab and removing the drive. And this is a genuine IBM ThinkPad option made by IBM. And this is actually a five gigabyte drive. So pretty decent size there. And realistically, ladies and gentlemen, we can take it down further uh, if we wanted to do like a CPU swap or whatever, but those are the fundamental components that you would remove to quickly service this machine. So that's pretty cool. Even though it's not a bento box style, it's still very, very easy to service. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and reassemble this and turn it on because yes, this does work. All right, I believe there is a small amount of charge in this battery. So let's see if we can get it to uh, turn on. Power is on the side. So ladies and gentlemen, regardless of what you needed to do when this was made, it did it very well. Photoshop 5.5 works on this like a champ. And of course, when you aren't working, you could always sneak on a pastime or two for your own enjoyment, like Quake. Now, as you can see, running Quake at its native resolution is probably not going to be that favorable, but if you are looking for better FPS, you can always drop down the resolution and things will be considerably more manageable. Even stepping it down to 800 by 600 buys us back a considerable amount of frames. At any rate, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you've enjoyed taking a look at the ThinkPad 600. It's a fantastic piece of gear that has so much heritage for the modern T-Series that I absolutely had to take a look at it on the channel. If you do enjoy these retrospectives on these older machines and the history, then this is a channel that you definitely want to subscribe to. And then I also look at new machines from time to time as they come by. I, of course, want to give a shout out to Tommy again for helping me get this into Canada. And also a shout out to David Hill, who through his interviews have given me a new appreciation for this particular machine and all of the initiatives that it brought to the ThinkPad family. If you'd like to be notified right away of my next video, then I am going to encourage you to do the big four. Please like the video, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. So the next time I feature a cool retro machine like this, you'll be the first to know about it. Thank you so much, and I will see you next time.